In this video, I'm going to look at the different types of intermolecular force. So we've got permanent dipole, permanent dipole intermolecular forces. And they are also known as permanent induced dipole forces. We've got hydrogen bonds. And finally, we've got induced dipole dipole forces, which are also known as London forces or London dispersion forces and even van der Waals forces. So all I'm going to do is take each of these intermolecular forces in turn and I'll do them in the order on the board there and explain with some examples how they arise. So permanent dipole, permanent dipole first. These occur between molecules that contain a permanent dipole. So something like hydrogen chloride because of the electronegativity difference in the molecule, we've got chlorine, which is quite electronegative, hydrogen not as electronegative. The electron density in this molecule will be permanently towards the chlorine. So we get this permanent dipole in the molecule. So if you had a container full of hydrogen chloride molecules, I've only drawn three on the board there, you can see that each molecule has the same dipole in it and therefore the atoms on neighbouring molecules would attract each other where you have these opposite charges. So we're going to get an intermolecular force between the slightly negative end of this hydrogen chloride molecule and the slightly positive end of this hydrogen chloride molecule. So these dotted lines I'm drawn on now, these are the intermolecular forces. So we'll look at hydrogen bonds now. And essentially, these are just a special type of permanent dipole, permanent dipole intermolecular force. So when does the name switch from permanent dipole, permanent dipole to hydrogen bond? Well, your molecule, you can see in brown there, your molecule must have a hydrogen directly bonded to either a fluorine, an oxygen or a nitrogen. So there's three examples of molecules that have hydrogen bonds between them. Hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen directly bonded to a fluorine. Water, hydrogen directly bonded to an oxygen. And ammonia, hydrogen directly bonded to a nitrogen. So I'll illustrate hydrogen bonds using ammonia. So what I'm going to do is explain how we show the hydrogen bonds between these two ammonia molecules. So the first thing we need to do is show the dipole on the molecule. So nitrogen is one of the top three most electronegative elements. So that's going to be slightly negative, which makes the hydrogen slightly positive. So we'll just show the dipole across one bond. We'll do the same in this molecule here, delta minus, delta plus. The next thing that we have to show is a lone pair on this electronegative atom. So on this nitrogen here, let's draw a lone pair. And then the final thing we do is we show the interaction between the molecules, but we must go from the lone pair on the nitrogen on this molecule to the hydrogen on the neighbouring molecule. So whenever you're asked to draw these, either in class or on an exam question, the three things you must remember, you show the dipole across the bond, so delta minus, in this case on the nitrogen, delta plus on the hydrogen. Show the lone pair on the electronegative atom, so the F, the O or the N. And then the hydrogen bond must be drawn between the lone pair and the hydrogen of a neighbouring molecule. And the only other point I want to make is that the hydrogen bond is stronger than the permanent dipole, permanent dipole intermolecular force. So the third and final type of intermolecular force we're looking at are induced dipole, dipole forces or interactions, also known as London dispersion forces. So this is actually the weakest of the three types of intermolecular force and they occur between non-polar molecules. 
So they're molecules without any kind of permanent dipole. So we'll use chlorine to illustrate this. So there's two chlorine molecules drawn up here. These are obviously non-polar because the chlorines have identical electronegativities. So how on earth do they interact with each other? They haven't got a permanent dipole on them. They haven't got these slight charges on them. How can these interact? And what we've got to appreciate to understand this is that the electrons that are involved in something like chlorine, they're constantly on the move. So electron density is constantly moving. Now if we were to freeze time, what would be the case is the electrons wouldn't be completely symmetrically arranged around the molecule. There would be a slight imbalance of electron density. So if I just put these electrons here and I'll put a fewer electrons on that side. So at any instant, electron density is uneven. So at that instant in time, we've got slightly more electron density on the right hand side of the molecule, slightly less on the left. So what's that going to do? It's going to put a tiny little dipole across the molecule, with, in this case a slightly negative end here, and a slightly positive end here. And because this dipole only occurs for this instant in time, it's called an instantaneous dipole. So we're never going to have just one isolated chlorine molecule. We're going to have billions and billions of molecules all neighbouring each other. So I've brought in a second chlorine molecule in here. This instantaneous dipole on this one is going to have an effect on the electron density on this one. And this bulge in electron density here is going to repel the electron density on this one over to this end and set up a dipole this way around on this one. Now because this, this dipole here on the neighbouring molecule is technically being forced onto it by the neighbouring molecule, another way of saying forced is induced. So this is an induced dipole. And of course, now we've got opposite dipoles in neighbouring molecules next to each other. There's going to be an attraction. And because this attraction is between induced dipoles, forced dipoles, that's where that name comes from. And just remember, if we've got a mole of chlorine, we've actually got Avogadro's number of chlorine molecules in our container. So the molecule here would induce a dipole in this one, which then induces a dipole on this one, which would then induce a dipole on the next one, and so on. So it's a bit like a domino effect. You can see I've changed the diagram slightly. I just want to pick up on point one here. The electron density is actually constantly moving. It's never really frozen in time. The electrons don't stop. So at the next instant in time, the electron density could be this way around. So it's flipped over like a windscreen wiper, which just has the same effect on the next molecule and just creates the induced dipole but just the other way around. But you can see that black dotted line, that intermolecular force is still there and so the molecules are still attracted to each other by this induced dipole force. The last thing I want to say on this type of intermolecular force is that induced dipole-dipole interactions actually get stronger as the number of electrons in the molecule increase and this is very nicely illustrated in the halogens so at the top of group 7 we've got F2 nonpolar molecules so it's going to have these induced dipole dipole inter interactions this is a gas at room temperature and pressure chlorine is also a gas at room temperature and pressure but it's got a higher boiling point than fluorine and that's because chlorine has more electrons in its molecules than fluorine does. So the intermolecular forces are that little bit stronger. It's going to take a little bit more energy to separate the molecules. Remember, we're not breaking bonds. And the trend just continues. You can see there, bromine is actually a liquid at room temperature and pressure. 
and iodine is a solid. Now, all due to the fact that as the number of electrons increase in the molecules, the size of the induced dipole-dipole interactions is increasing. We've actually got a model of an iodine lattice here, just to show you. So we've got our individual iodine molecules here, and these intermolecular forces, these induced dipole-dipole interactions occur between the molecules. Now, even though iodine exists as a solid at room temperature and pressure, it doesn't take a lot of energy to overcome these and actually vaporize it. We'll just finish with this summary. So we've got induced dipole-dipole interactions. These are the weakest intermolecular forces. They get stronger as the number of electrons in the molecules increase and they exist between non-polar molecules. Then we've got permanent dipole-dipole interactions. These are intermediate strength intermolecular forces, so they're stronger than induced dipole-dipole, but weaker than hydrogen bonds. And these occur between polar molecules, i.e. molecules with permanent dipoles in them. And the final one, hydrogen bonds, it's the strongest of the three intermolecular forces, and it's just a special type of permanent dipole-dipole force. You've got to have a hydrogen directly bonded to a fluorine, or a hydrogen directly bonded to an oxygen, or a hydrogen directly bonded to a nitrogen in your molecule.